Okay, so we'll get started. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this program on 181 years of New Hampshire Hospital. I have the pleasure of welcoming you and introducing you um, to our speaker. Uh, my name is Bernie Seifert. I'm Deputy Director at NAMI New Hampshire. And I just want to take a brief moment to recognize that next Tuesday, uh, October 31st, 2023, which will be Halloween, uh, will mark the 60th anniversary of the Community Mental Health um, Act. So back in 1963, President John F. Kennedy passed the Community Mental Health Act as part of his new frontier agenda. And that was the beginning of a um, network of mental health centers um, throughout the country. And I think Dr. Shigori will get a little bit more into that um, in a bit. Um, so the, the act recognized that while our mental health system should have the capacity to address all levels of care, um, including psychiatric, inpatient psychiatric care, um, it recognized that treatment is most effective when delivered in one's own community, and that should be held at a high priority. So in the spirit of the Community Mental Health Act, NAMI New Hampshire continues to encourage um, further funding locally and nationally for community mental health services, and also the creation of new initiatives to address the gaps in care um, and increase the provision of services in, community, in communities. Um, so now we're gonna travel back in time, back at actually 181 years uh, with our presenter, Dr. Paul Shigori. Um, Dr. Shigori graduated from Tufts University, uh, then continued on to the University of Florida with, um, with a PhD in psychology. Um, he worked at comprehensive community mental health centers in Maine and New Hampshire back in the 70s and early 80s. Um, he's the co-founder of the Greenhouse Group, and he served there as a clinician and community mental health uh, consultant for over 25 years. Um, he later became chief psychologist at New Hampshire Hospital from 2006 until he retired back in 2013. So welcome Dr. Shigori and the screen is yours. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to, to talk with you today. I'm always glad to share this information and um, respond to questions and uh, learn from people, share what I've learned with, with other people. I want to thank the New Hampshire Human Humanities Council, which originally um, kind of got me to create a, a presentation about New Hampshire Hospital and its history. Um, so thank you. New Hampshire Humanities Council, and there are uh, countless people I want to thank, which I won't take the time to do right now, but but anyone who's contributed to this, thank you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do two things. I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about my experience, very briefly. I'm going to um, talk about the history of New Hampshire Hospital, which is really a history of the um, treatment, understanding, lack of understanding, lack of treatment of people with mental illness, what we now call mental illness. Um, so I'm gonna start back in the, in the 1830s about the creation of the hospital, why it came into being, how the hospital evolved over, over the 181 years that it's been there, and then talk about the great changes that happened with deinstitutionalization and the Community Mental Health Centers Act um, and where we are now. And I'm glad to respond to any questions that any of you have um, as we go along. So I guess you can submit questions through chat and um, when I get them, I'll find a convenient way as best I can to, to kind of respond to them. If I don't get to them as I'm talking, um, I'll remind myself to go over any questions that might've come up at the end and we can take some time to talk about that. I'm, I'm not going to give as formal a presentation as I did with the Humanities Council. So um, I'm glad to be um, just responsive and have more of a dialogue with you as things may come up and you want to talk more about them. That's fine with me. Um, I also want to say that while this is a story of um, the history of a, of a movement and it's kind of an abstract title, it's actually the story of people tens of thousands of people when we think of the patients who have been at New Hampshire Hospital. And 
I don't know how you would measure the number of people whose stories this is when it comes to talking about the Community Mental Health Centers Act and, and the um, implications that had for the treatment of the mentally ill since uh, it began to go into effect in the late 60s and, and 70s. Um, so uh, briefly about me, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I, I worked at community mental health centers starting in 1971 in Bangor, Maine at a brand spanking new community mental health center that was just opening, which served the, the Bangor community, which was, a, I wouldn't say metropolitan, but at least an urban community, but it also served five counties in uh, very rural Maine, all the way up to the Canadian border on the, on the coastline. So it served Hancock County, all of Hancock County, all of Piscataquis County, all of Penobscot County, um, covered Baxter State Park, where Mount Katahdin is some very, very rural areas. And, and the challenge, which was a wonderful challenge at that point, was to try to provide services to people in both downtown Bangor and in the, in the deep uh, rural areas of, of Maine. Um, it was an exciting time, the 1970s were, for community mental health centers. I moved to New Hampshire in 1976, and um, I've had experience with the community mental health centers here, both in Maine and here. It was in the thick of deinstitutionalization. Bangor State Hospital was being deinstitutionalized, and of course, the only psychiatric hospital in New Hampshire, New Hampshire Hospital, was going through a huge um, deinstitutionalization. And I'd like to take some time to talk about that, not just my experiences, but the experiences of our, our country um, from the point of view of both the patients and those providing services and the communities themselves. And I'd like to take some time at the end to um, look at where we are now briefly with you and, and talk about some of the important challenges that I see and the state we're in now. Um, so I'm gonna start in a minute with the 1830s and come now to the 2020s, um, almost 200 years of where, we, where we've come and how we've moved and what the checkered story of um, what's now called mental illness has, has, um, has gone through over these 200 years. So um, the, I'm gonna start with Governor Samuel Dinsmore in the early 1830s. There was, a, there was a general movement um, nationwide in this country following some of what had been happening in Europe towards uh, thinking differently about people who were, who were different, who we now um, say would have behavioral problems, mental illnesses. Um, they weren't thought of as illnesses at that time. They were just thought of as um, behavior that was impossible to, to cope with. So, uh, while there had been um, some retreats, as they were called in England, or um, hospitals, uh, asylums, that had started in this country, and by the way, New Hampshire Hospital was um, 17th in the nation and 7th in New England. So there were other um, institutions, the experience of which New Hampshire drew on. Um, and there was a spirit of... Um, well, uh, human rights and human justice, human needs. Our, our country was going through an incredible time of growth. Um, and it was looking at what's happening to people in this country and what, what are their needs? How do we understand what to do with people that are, are a problem uh, that we don't know how to solve? Um, as it happened in some other states, Governor Dinsmore wanted to start with a, um, a study of what's happening with people who are considered insane um, in New Hampshire. So um, he sent out a questionnaire with the support of the legislature to um, the state. And I'm gonna um, read for you in a second, a little bit of the results of that study. But I wanna say that um, this was a, a bright moment in human history because it was the, th these opening decades of the 1800s, because it was the first time that people began to think 
This maybe is an illness which could be cured. This is not like a condition which people are, for whatever reasons, born with, and there's nothing we can do about it except let them and us suffer with this. Um, it was kind of a lifetime sentence. That's the, That was the view, whether it was con all the different ways that mental illnesses were construed. Um, this was a moment in history when people were beginning to think there could be help for these people. There could, there could be cured. It could be an illness which could be treated. So that was a fundamental shift in kind of human thinking. And the, uh, the study by Governor Dinsmore was a was kind of a response to that. So um, the study was carried out. Um, the the 183 towns in New Hampshire responded. The the results briefly showed that there were about 350 people that these various um, towns considered insane when they were all added up, and they were almost equally men and women. Um, and the condition of those roughly 300, I think it was 312 people, was that half of them were considered insane paupers, which were um, left to the public to take care of. The, the remainder were taken care of by family or friends. Um, so the focus was on these, quote, insane paupers who were... Um, found to be, I, I won't read you all the uh, details of it, but they were, they were found to be in um, almshouses, poor farms, but even more so, they were in barns, in outbuildings, in attics, um, often in cages, chained, um, restricted. There were some who were uh, considered not so dangerous, who were um, actually auctioned off from year to year to whoever would bid for them. And, and uh, they went with that uh, person who, who uh, paid the auction price and, and worked at, at all kinds of uh, menial tasks, really. Um, they were the victims of incredible mistreatment. And you can read uh, newspaper articles and you can read this report and, and other um, pieces from the 1840s that showed uh, the degree of suffering, not only for the people themselves, but for their families, for their communities. The communities didn't know really what to do with them. So uh, as a result of this study, the legislature was encouraged to take some action, which they did. They formed a, a 12 trustees who were charged with um, a study to construct an asylum in New Hampshire. And the instructions were to, ins to construct a study, uh, uh, an asylum that would house 120 patients on average. And that was based on their finding that there were 150 um, insane paupers. So that was the beginning of the New Hampshire Asylum for the Insane. The, uh, a director was found who was very experienced, a superintendent who had been superintendent of the Worcester Asylum in Massachusetts, had experience of several years because the Worcester Asylum opened almost 10 years before the New Hampshire Asylum. Um, he was paid $1,000. That was his salary. The, there was fierce competition for where the hospital would be, which is hard to imagine today that people would be competing for where an insane asylum would, would be located. But... It came down to Portsmouth and Concord. Um, Portsmouth tried to induce the trustees with um, a couple of persuasive arguments. One was that there was ample seafood, which everybody knew, this is a quote, everybody knew was the best diet for people who are insane. And the second was that Portsmouth was the most genteel society in New Hampshire at the time. But the trustees were unconvinced by those inducements and um, actually chose Concord. Concord put up a grant of $9,500 to help purchase 120 acres, which is the campus where New Hampshire Hospital is now. 
the campus expanded over the over the 200 years, expanded and then sharply um, decreased. But it started out as 120 acres, and there was going to be a building which would be overseen by the trustees. And um, Dr. Chandler to uh, construct a building that could house 120 persons. Now, this was not a small thing. I mean, if you recollect that New Hampshire was an agricultural society, 1840s before the Civil War, um, no real metropolitan areas. Um, and how was the state going to set up a hospital that could serve people on a statewide basis. Um, it was a busy and bustling time too. Um, Concord was the center of what was going to develop to be a um, important railroad network. This is in the 1840s, the first depot in Concord opened the same year, 1842, as the hospital doors. Um, communication and travel was, was beginning to change. Industrialization was just, um, not quite um, arriving in full force to New Hampshire, but it was coming. So it was a time of a lot of change in New Hampshire. Um, the hospital was begun in 1841, finished in 1842. The doors opened to the first patient. And I'm gonna read you, if you give me a minute to find the uh, copy of his admission and record to New Hampshire Hospital. I'm gonna read you a little bit to try to give you a feeling about um, where we were in, in, it was in October, late October, so it's almost exactly this time of year um, that the first patient came through the doors of New Hampshire Hospital. And by the way, um, the building that's constructed is still there, it's main building. You can, you can see it when you drive on the campus. Um, you can walk in it, it's a state building that's open for administrative purposes now. There are offices in it, but the, the balconies and the structure, you, you can, if you go there, you can still see where some of the strong rooms were. You can get a feeling for the, for the original building still by, by being there, even though it's been many times renovated and changed inside. So hang on while I, um, while I find the notes for um, the, the admission of the first patient. Okay, I'm reading now from the original hospital uh, records. William C. of Tuftonboro, age 35, of nervous and bilious temperament, of large, bony, and muscular frame, came into the asylum October 29, 1842. He is a farmer of comfortable means and always has his work done in season, is married and has three sons. His father was well off in the world and William's education was attended to. We don't know what that means, but it was attended to. Um, he was known as a good man and good neighbor. He was a member of the uh, community church and he was distinguished for his gifts in public prayer. And then there's a note that his aunt and sister may have been insane. We don't know what that means, but um, it's, it's sort of significant to think about. So here's the uh, conditions that led to his admission. A protracted second Advent meeting was held in the vicinity and he attended. He took part in the meeting, said he could do his own preaching and was Jesus Christ himself. He soon became noisy and at times violent, not generally disposed to do injury to persons or things, he would preach to his family at home for hours. He would annoy his wife um, and his wife uh, noted that he became so bad that she did not feel safe without calling in the neighbors. He then became jealous of her. He was brought to the asylum in irons and, and he was accompanied by family um, and friends. Uh, irons on his ankles and wrists. Um, about two weeks um, into this period of 
preaching for hours and becoming easily irritable um, and was daily getting worse. So here's the first note about intervention at the hospital. He was bled by the physician in the arms and head without apparent benefit. He was given uh, disabstruents, which are like um, cathartics and emetics um, to try to clean out his system, a common uh, medical intervention at the time. After about eight weeks, he seemed to be improving favorably and during the last three weeks of his residence was quiet and well improved. His wife on a visit found him in this state and judging him to be as well as she saw he now appeared to be, took him home. And then there's a note. Um, one week after his return home, he was doing nicely as his friends reported. Heard that he went some miles doing uh, transactions of business and appeared quiet and well. So um, this was not an uncommon story for patients who, who came at this time. The, the leading uh, cause of admission over these first years at the hospital was religious excitement. And I won't go into all the details of why it was that um, kind of diagnosis, but it was a period where there was great, um, there were these large tent meetings all over New England and New York and, and preaching about a second coming. And there was a date predicted to be in 1843 when a second judgment would happen. So people were religiously stirred up either in fear of what would happen at the, to them at the second judgment or in fear of the, the end of the earth. So there was a, there was a stirring up generally in, in the culture. And um, uh, by a, a Reverend Miller. So that there's a diagnosis you would see if you look at the first five years or so of records of Millerism, which was a diagnosis for this religious excitement. But you can get a feeling for um, this gentleman being out of control, a problem for his family and community, a person who otherwise, um, up until that time, as far as we know, was was a productive member of society and not in any way considered a problem, but he was considered by his community to be insane. His behavior was at this time brought to the asylum. And after eight weeks of um, treatment that they were offering there was discharged and improved. So I'm going to tell you now that um, we'll talk about what the treatment actually was in a minute, but the common um, cure rate for these early admissions over the first, really over the first almost 20 years of asylum um, experiences was about a 90% cure rate. That's, that was their rate. People were discharged, improved, and sometimes completely cured. And they did their best to follow up. Um, it wasn't just based on the fact that they were in the hospital and suddenly over a period of um, the first six months is, is usually the, the period that they're talked about when they measured how their improvement. So um, this was really a remarkable and startling intervention and greeted with uh, incredible enthusiasm by, by the public. They, they saw family go being very disturbed, unruly, worried about what to do, worried about them becoming violent, worried about them becoming so depressed and withdrawn that no one could reach them, worried about them not eating, worried about their um, abnormal behavior and saw a remarkable improvement. So um, in the history of interventions, this, this period in the early uh, 19th century kind of stands out as a time when there were not only inventions and uh, interventions and a new understanding about this might be an illness that could be cured, but actually a high rate of improvement among people. Um, stands out, looking back at this from 2023, there's nothing that seems to match the success of this time. So a lot of good questions arise out of that, like what, what was going on? What, was, what were the interventions and, and uh, what led to people improving? But I do wanna say, uh, it was a different society in the 1830s and 40s and 50s than it is in the middle of the 21st century now. And 
um, as we look quickly, which I'm going to try to go through rather quickly at the changes that happened from 1842 to where we are now, um, you'll see why uh, life was di so different then and now and how the view of mental illness and the interventions for mental illness are remarkably different than, than they were now. Um, the primary treatment was called moral treatment. And um, if I was gonna recommend a book to you to understand what was meant by moral treatment, it would be this, this book, which is called, it's an old book, but a, but a very good one. It's called um, Moral Treatment in Community uh, Mental Illness and, uh, or Community Mental Health. It's by a person named um, Bachoven, B-O-C-K-O-V-E-N. And it reviews the whole development history and, and uh, experience of moral treatment. It was called Moral Treatment because it was based on um, kindness, respect, and they were called asylums because their aim was to set up a um, environment that would be relatively free of stress, peaceful, um, provide people with with support and um, and and uh, tranquility. They were given some narcotics, which were a variety of either opiates or other narcotics, but not very much. They were not given very much. They were given some to sleep and some when they were agitated. But most of the kindness um, and respect come, came from the, the uh, superintendent and the attendants who were carefully selected and, and um, trained a great deal and who actually lived with them. That in main building, the original hospital at New Hampshire Hospital, there, were, there was a wing for women on one side, a wing for men on the other side, um, and some business offices in the middle, a kitchen in the basement, um, and la some laundry facilities and so forth. But um, everyone stayed at the asylum. Dr. Chandler stayed at the asylum with his family, all in main building. They didn't all sleep in the same quarters. The, the patients were in the wings um, on the side, but the, uh, the attendants slept in the wings with the patients. The, the, there was a physician um, superintendent, an assistant superintendent who was also a physician, and some other um, staff that were called higher level attendants. There was no nurses per se at this time, who, who stayed, lived in the, in the center part of, the, of what's now main building. So it was a community. I mean, it was a community of people that all lived together. They woke up in the morning. The attendants would, were instructed um, to wake up the patients carefully, um, encourage them to get up for breakfast. And the, I won't take the time to read it, but there, there's in the handbooks of their the attendance instructions, it points out to them that they must always be restrained in their treatment of the patients. They, they must ascertain what the patient's wishes are, um, not promise anything that wasn't possible to deliver, um, accompany the patients when they walked around, take them for walks. There was a working farm. The patients were encouraged to work on the farm to the extent that they wanted to, and the attendants worked with them. No one was made to work. Um, patients were encouraged to rest, eat healthy food, get fresh air. Um, the, the hospital had a a wonderful supply of fresh water in the beginning, um, which they safeguarded actually for a very long time into the 20th century. And, and there was a focus on the importance of fresh water, fresh air, exercise, participation in activities with other patients, which mostly involved farm activities or um, also uh, sewing, crocheting, uh, carpentry work, uh, a number of kinds of range of things um, so I'm going to skip ahead now from 1842. Um, the original superintendent left after about 10 years. Two superintendents followed. The same model of moral treatment was at the backbone of what happened when patients were admitted. They stayed for a range of time that could be from several weeks to um, several months. But most of the patients um, who were brought in were um, 
were sent by selectmen from the counties or towns that they were in and the town paid and the rate was $2.50 a day, um, $2.25 if you were in state, which most patients were, $2.50 if you were out of state. The, um, the hospital was self-sufficient, one of the few asylums, I'll try to remember to call it an asylum. The asylum was self-sufficient um, until the late 1800s. So it's, it, it provided for itself without any state funding by the charge, which was um, for, for those who couldn't afford it, was paid for by their, their towns. Um, some people paid themselves um, the, the 225 a day. Um, it, was a, it became a very large working farm over the decades, um, spread out. The hospital began to occupy more than the original 120 acres. It covered all the way down to where um, Route 89 crosses Clinton Street now on both sides of the street. So where White Farm is, um, where the Concord High School um, uh, football fields and soccer fields are was all part of the farm. Um, there were very large stables and barns, some of which I think still remain um, where White Farm is. Um, so patients could have an active day, were encouraged to have an active day, were encouraged to interact with other, with other patients. Um, and the heart of the treatment was to listen and treat patients kindly. They were fed, they, were, they had plenty of opportunity to rest. Um, they were taken out of sort of life, um, given a chance to rest, talk, um, be supported, and, and then discharged. And yes. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Would you mind if I ask them? No, not at all. Okay, wanted to make sure it was a good time first. Yep. Um, let's see. Uh, from UNH, on the alleged 90% cure rate in the 1840s, what constituted as cured and who decided? Should we accept these numbers or should we rather treat them as historical artifacts? They should be treated somewhere between historical artifacts and and accurate. There, there were the the um, the superintendents actually kept the data and made the determinations. They discharged patients. Most of the discharges in the early days were similar to the first patient that I read you. Families would visit and and decide with the superintendent. He seems fine. She seems to be doing well. Can we take her home now? and they would make a decision. And attempts were made to follow up by mail or sometimes um, in, patients were encouraged to come back to visit and they would sit down and talk. Um, the cure rates of 90% were, were inflated, I think, um, to some degree. Uh, but um, I think the, the cure rates, even if we have them, 50% uh, improved and cured rate is pretty good but, but we have to remember the illnesses themselves were different. The society was different. Life was different. Um, I, don't, I don't think um, those statistics are especially meaningful. I, I'm bringing them up because I wanna point out to you that the hospital served a purpose, um, did a good job. There were some people who returned for uh, readmissions, but a very low rate and that communities mostly reabsorb even the most difficult people. Um, and that the, the lessons in kindness, there, there are many stories that are, are included in some of the old records of um, how people dramatically improved and how they found a certain strength or how they changed their, their view of life or how they learned um, to not think about some of the things that were bothering them as much as they did before. And uh, Dr. Jesse Bancroft, who became the superintendent in, um, in the 18, 18, late 1850s and was superintendent for um, 25 years. And his son, Dr. Charles Bancroft followed him. So there was a father and son superintendency of these two uh, doctors. Um, were, they were superintendents for over 60 years. So through all the rest of the uh, 19th century, it was really the Bancroft um, superintendency. 
uh, the hospital grew, but it, it followed the same model. And there's a quote, I won't read it to you because it'll take me a minute to find it from Dr. Jesse Bancroft, which in effect says, there are lots of different manifestations of, of mental disease, but they seem to have one central element, uh, which is the one we're addressing. People are absorbed with themselves, with their own thinking, with their own fears, and with their own worries. If we can help them um, move the focus off themselves by getting them to interact with other people, getting them involved in activities that are meaningful and rewarding to them, um, stop them from what he describes as a morbid self-occupation, um, they're going to improve to some degree. So that, that was the focus. It was activity um, praise oriented. It was um, thinking of others oriented. People shared their stories. It wasn't like group therapy, but as they worked, as they got to know each other, living you know, a daily life with each other, they shared um, stories which gave them a different perspective of themselves. That was actually what happened. Um, apparently. Do you have you, another Ray. question? I think that was the only one in the chat right now. Okay. But I'll let you know if another one pops up. Okay, it's fine. And uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Thanks. So um, the short story of what happened um, with New Hampshire Hospital is that every year there were more admissions and more people. Um, the If you look at the census of the hospital, it grew every every year. Um, so, um, by the time we get to the, to, uh, and patients stayed longer, um, and longer and more patients were admitted who had senile dementias that, that wasn't happening originally. Originally they were in county homes, um, and, uh, increasingly patients who the staff didn't increase, so the ratio of staff to patients began to change as we get to there being not 120 or 150 patients, but 300 and 400 patients, the same number of staff. There just wasn't time to um, spend with people in the same way as there was in the, the original decades. I think um, there's kind of a general agreement that the the patients originally got remarkable attention, unrealistic, actually, attention from the attendants and physicians. Um, and um, more and more uh, difficult patients came to be hospitalized, patients with um, organic illnesses, um, like uh, a, one that was increased significantly in the latter part of the 1800s was tertiary syphilis, there's no, there's no cure for it. It causes uh, delusions and uh, persecutory feelings because the brain is actually being um, destroyed by the, by the syphilitic disease. And um, other organic diseases more and more came to New Hampshire Hospital. So originally it was not designed and the treatment wasn't designed for those kinds of patients. So the length of stay by the time we get to the end of the 1800s is in multiple years. Um, the average length of stay, for example, by 1910 was up to um, 15 years for women and 20 years for men. So we're, now we have patients who can only be um, kept comfortable as much as possible for the rest of their life. and. Um, more and more elderly patients came um, with all kinds of elder, elder illnesses. There weren't exactly nursing homes in those um, in, in the 19th century. And New Hampshire Hospital became a magnet for um, lots of kinds of problems. Um, so the hospital increased. The, the main building had um, additions built onto it in every direction possible until um, the next uh, building was built, which was Bancroft Building, it was built in the 1980s. It's a Victorian style building. It looks like a large home. Um, 
here's a picture of it. I'll show it as best I can. Um, it's it was it's a it was a residence for women, a residence for women who were um, able to live in a home-like environment. It had individual rooms for them. There were fireplaces and living rooms and parlors. It was built on a model that had been described as successful in Europe, where if you built the hospital like a home um, and treat people as if it was a home, it'll be easy for them to make an adjustment to being home. Um, it was not uh, the big buildings that were built later in the 20th century that housed more, that had a more, um, I don't want to say warehouse kind of look, but but how huge numbers of people in, in very, very large dormitories, uh, crowded rooms. Um, so what was happening was uh, a wider variety of people were being admitted to New Hampshire Asylum. Um, people who had, as the population of the country increased, people who had no other resources, there were large increases in immigrant populations as people immigrated more and more to New Hampshire. Um, the population of New Hampshire swelled, um, moved from being an agricultural environment to a much more industrialized uh, Manchester, the mills in Manchester, Nashua, every even smaller towns had mills that employed many people. And people were encouraged to come to New Hampshire to work in the mills. Um, you probably know the stories of the um, farm girls, particularly from uh, Southern Quebec who were uh, induced to come from their family farms to, to live in the mills in um, particularly Manchester, Nashua, uh, Claremont, other, other mill villages. And most villages began to uh, have some mill industries. The shoe industry came, the other industries came. Um, New Hampshire became a mill state as well as an agricultural state. And that led to different kinds of problems, um, different kinds of um, patients came to New Hampshire hospital, patients who are disconnected from family, patients who, uh, more depression, more hopelessness, more um, agitation, more delusions. Um, so when we get to um, the start of the 20th century, New Hampshire hospital is, every year it's overcrowded, every year there are more patients than there are bed space. You can you can look at the um, graphs. I won't take the time to show them because I'm going pretty slowly here and I want to catch up. Um, but the graph is remarkable for how much it grows. There's a graph of increasing um, bed space, but it's always superimposed on the need for even more beds. And the legislature became stingier. Now, in 1902, uh, very significant change happened. The state took over New Hampshire Hospital. It had been a private asylum up until that time and funded itself without aid from the state. In 1902, the state um, changed it to New Hampshire State Hospital, which was common for what was happening in other New England states and upper um, Eastern states as well. The hospitals were taken over by the state. The, the uh, private model was not working. Not enough people could pay and the counties and towns couldn't afford even at the low rate of a few dollars a day, five dollars a day for patients, couldn't afford to do this. So it became a state hospital, um, 1902, and that meant that both the um, poor farms and the county homes, which were where many of the elderly went because families couldn't care for them, all were gonna be transferred to New Hampshire Hospital. So the population really began to jump after 1902. Um, so, so by say um, the 1930s were over a thousand patients for a hospital that was originally built to, for 120. Um, the the number of the, the state couldn't really keep up with the funding that was needed. So there were ratios. Well, this trend continued up to the 1950s. The, the largest population of New Hampshire Hospital in the middle 1950s 
was just over 2,700 patients. So if you can imagine 2,700 patients, um, over a thousand staff to run the farm, do the laundry, cook the food, getting food out three meals a day to patients, this many patients, 2,700. Um, most of the patients were um, no longer um, treated and released. I mean, they were, they were there for long periods of time. I told you by 1910, the average length of stay was 15 years. It's hard to believe this, 20 years for men, 15 years for women. Um, but in 1950, the average was, um, it was even higher. It was in the, the average length of stay was more than two decades, close to three decades for the, for the average patient. Imagine that. And, um, the hospital had become this huge, sprawling uh, employer, and it all—it was, it had. Well, you can imagine the cooking that had to be done for two thousand seven hundred people, three meals a day. The laundry that had to be done for this number of people. So, although the hospital built new buildings, had beds for people, they couldn't really provide care. The ratios became one doctor per. Um, 60 to 70 patients. They couldn't get to know their patients. And the, the nursing staff, which um, was a wonderful boom to the hospital in the late 1800s when New Hampshire Hospital started its own specialized training of nurses for, for mental, uh, people with mental problems, couldn't keep up. Um, the um, it just overwhelmed the hospital. And uh, frankly, mental illness by the time we're in 1910, 1915, 1920, was not a, a topic of, of, of popular concern for people. They were much more concerned about other pressing issues and the state expenditures um, had to address lots of other things, roads, um, for example, um, transportation. Um, more business-oriented concerns. Um, so the state legislature did not really have a high interest in dealing with mental illness. Okay, so we come to the late 50s. Hospitals were overcrowded. There's um, another question in the chat. Would you like me to ask you now or wait Sure, a yeah, no, okay. go ahead. Um, Lisa in the chat says, I'm researching a woman from Cannon who died in the asylum in 1888 at the age of 65. There is no court order for her committal. Did patients, did patients voluntarily commit themselves as if they were checking into a hospital more for their physical health than emotional? And is it true that all patient records prior to 1980 have been destroyed? Um. I can't answer the last part of that question for sure. Um, I don't know. I think the the some records are available because when I worked at the hospital, you could still get at New Hampshire Hospital, although they were transferred to the State Archive Building, you could get some of the original handwritten notes of the first patients. For example, the one that I read you, but the, um, at some point, most of the hospital patients were put on what was called microfiche and um, so miniaturized and the, the original records, it was impossible to keep them stored, I guess. Um, and so they, they were kept though for a time. I don't know if they've all been destroyed or not. I, the hospital kept its own records till um, well into the sixties. And then they were, I think they were turned over to the state archives and I don't know what what happened, how many of them were turned over or not. I know that in the 1970s, um, New Hampshire Hospital had its own library and um, had many archival uh, reports and records there, but I know that those have all been turned over to the state archives and, and the hospital itself has, doesn't keep records um, in, its, in its possession now, um, only the more recent records. Um, so, uh, yes to the fact that patients could check themselves in, and yes, um, in a way, 
they could stay there if they could pay for it themselves or if they had a sponsor who could pay for it. The, it's been true for a, quite a while now that only involuntary admissions are made to New Hampshire Hospital. But that, that was a, um, a mid 20th century, probably even in the 1970s, you could admit yourself to New Hampshire Hospital. Um, but not many people admitted themselves um, from the 1930s on. Um, some people did, uh, don't get me wrong, but, but not many patients because uh, state hospitals became um, very unsavory and sometimes unsafe places and, and dreaded places for people to go. So they didn't choose that as a place to go. Um, but um, the question about that specific patient, yes, it's possible she could have admitted herself and, and been a resident at New Hampshire Hospital. Everything Although it was a dark time, most of the 20th century into the 19, till the Community Mental Health Centers Act was a dark time for state institutions nationally. Um, but that doesn't mean that patients didn't get um, treatments and it didn't, doesn't mean that they didn't, some of them improve. And it doesn't mean that they actually um, often felt safe, cared about and built important relationships with other patients. Um, the problem was more and more people were receiving less and less care. And uh, once there was a switch to the illness model, which happened over time, but formally happened when, the, when New Hampshire State Hospital became a hospital in 1902, um, the focus was on medical treatments and away from the more um, interpersonal treatments. So by the 19... Uh, 20s, they were experimenting with um, diabetic shock treatment, and then in the 1930s and 40s, electroshock treatment. There were cold baths, there were uh, other interventions, um, none of which were particularly successful. Um, not that people didn't benefit to some degree. And um, as the hospital became overcrowded, I mean, overcrowding was the big curse of all the large state hospitals. And for many states, trying to fund a state hospital was, was impossible for their budgets. It was too, too expensive um, to give good treatment to 2,700 people in New Hampshire was beyond what the public um, coffers could begin to afford. So, um, the hospital still, in many ways, was it was a safe place for people. It functioned as a farm into the 1970s, um, but uh, in 1960, in the 1960s and late 1950s, there was a there was a very uh, strong awareness that we have a problem with state hospitals. We can't continue to just keep building, building after building, and putting people in them. We can't afford to pay for the costs of trained staff. We can't afford um, to, to have people live at an institution, a state institution. Um, so the deplorable conditions, the, the lack of treatment, um, all led to several things happening. There were, there were legal problems and there were just plain humane problems. Uh, so the Community Mental Health Centers Act was the kind of flowering of a lot of kinds of thinking of what what can we do about this problem that we, we have to admit we have and we can't afford in the form it's in now. Um, and it was bad for people. It was bad for people to be removed from their families and communities and spend decades, really sometimes the rest of their lives in an institution where they didn't receive much in the way of care, um, even good food, um, warm space, adequate space to sleep, so a whole new um, a whole new dimension in the way of looking at things happened with the Community Mental Health Centers Act, which uh, was presented to Congress and, and promptly passed. So the Community Mental Health Centers Act is the first time that the federal government funded directly services to mentally ill. And it created a, a, a really a idealistic, visionary uh, model where 
um, mental, um, there would be a mental health system, not a hospital, but a system. And there had been some success in the 1950s that were be, things were be, beginning to be studied about psychotherapy as well as medications, which began in the 1950s, specialized for uh, mental illness, Thorazine, tranquilizers, antipsychotic medications were beginning to be developed in the 1950s and 60s. So uh, a variety of forces came together, which led to the passing of the Community Mental Health Centers Act, which um, had a model whereby patients would be receiving levels of care that they needed, but the 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 thrust would be for them to be returned to their communities and families, not kept in an institution, not the asylum model where they're taken away from stress and um, given treatment somewhere other than their home community. So the Community Mental Health Centers Act had five basic components, which were all considered equally important. Um, a hospitalization program, which was envisioned as a short-term hospitalization program, a partial hospitalization program, a suicide and crisis intervention program, which was an immediate response to mental health crises, a consultation and education program, um, which would reach out to the community to educate people about mental illness, identify early um, Intervent, needs for intervention and interve intervene as early as possible. So it brought a whole new level of things and the, the government funded these centers. If the communities could get together and agree on how they were gonna do this. So in New Hampshire, New Hampshire was divided into 10, they were called catchment areas, mental health areas. So that the communities in each of these 10 areas um, agreed on how they would have these various services offered and they would sponsor a grant. The federal government would consider it, would, would make a grant in cases where they made a grant, they would supervise and oversee it. And the funding was for a certain period of years. So it wasn't just like for a year. And the vision was that the community mental health centers would be an ongoing unfolding over a period of decades. Well, the community mental health center, I think in the early years was actually faced with this huge problem of deinstitutionalization. People who had been living decades in a hospital environment where they had three meals a day, didn't learn to cook, didn't, didn't learn to shop, didn't learn about any of the community skills that are necessary for living in a community. The early years of the community mental health center um, were devoted to two things, identifying a crisis and trying to intervene in them and deinstitutionalizing de hospitals, having people move from a hospital environment to a community-based environment. Um, I know we're getting near the end of the, the time and I'm sorry uh, that I haven't got to say a lot of what might be helpful to say, but- um, Paul, we have, until, we have until 1.30, so- um, okay. If you can go another 15, 20 minutes if you need to. Okay. So the Community Mental Health Centers Act um, was a very popular act. It, got, it was well-funded. It was supported by the federal government through the 1960s, through the 1970s. Um, and a dramatic change happened in 1980. I think that the community health, mental health centers, um, because they didn't really get um, they were still being developed into the late 70s. People were still applying for their first grant in the, in the late 1970s, and they were just um, developing, spreading. Get, people were getting used to that notion. Um, in, 19, in the 1980s, the community mental health centers, funding from the federal government stopped. The federal government, this was, this was under um, President Reagan, stopped direct funding of mental health services. They made block grants to the states and the states could use that money to continue funding mental health centers, but could also use some of that funding for other, other services. And um, that, that had a real um, kind of dramatic impact on community mental health centers. When the federal government stepped out of the picture, they didn't oversee them, they didn't manage the grants, they didn't 
um, process the grants. They didn't um, make visits to the mental health centers to give them feedback about what they needed to, to do differently, what they could do differently. There wasn't a sharing um, from one state to another on the same degree. Things went back to the states and each state managed the block grants differently. Some um, continued to fund strongly the community mental health centers model. Others um, made variations on the mental health center model. So for example, in, in many states, including New Hampshire, consultation and education to the community that was funded in, in my experience, um, the funding for that was reduced. The funding for hospitalization um, was at a much uh, reduced level as was um, uh, crisis and suicide intervention. So um, in New Hampshire, the mental health centers continued. There continued to be the catchment areas uh, covering the state and um, the mental health centers continued, but the, the funding was on a very different basis. For a time, um, in order to get funding uh, for hospitalizations, you had to certify that a patient was um, chronically um, and permanently mentally ill, which, which was a very difficult dilemma for mental health professionals because how do you know someone's illness is chronic or permanent? And to classify someone with a permanent mental illness became tantamount to um, sentencing them to uh, a limit of what they should expect of themselves. Um, so there were varieties of complications that really um, curtailed and altered the community mental health center's original uh, vision. At the same time, um, there was a, a lawsuit filed in Alabama against a state hospital there um, in 1971. Wyatt versus Stickney um, is, the, is the case. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. And for the first time, a court in the United States ruled that people have a right to treatment, particularly people who were um, involuntarily hospitalized. It, it became illegal to, Ill, to um, hospitalize someone involuntarily and not provide treatment to them. And um, the court oversaw what had to happen in Alabama, which became a model for other states. Um, they could not they could not hospitalize people for a mental illness um, and not provide um, a certain basic standard of treatment for them. So this was very complicated and difficult to, to put into practice actually. And um, a lot of the promise of the Community Mental Health Centers Act was based on a belief that um, many, many people who had chronic illnesses could be treated with medication. And that was true and, and continues to be true, but it was not, uh, as it, as it uh, evolved, it didn't turn out to be quite the way people originally imagined. There were very difficult side effects to taking long-term, some of the early long-term medications. So um, there were uh, Thorazine and its sort of sister drugs produced some very um, uh, toxic side effects for many patients if they took them over the long, the long term. Um, there, were, there was weight gain and um, an increase in uh, diabetes and some other illnesses as, as it became clear that some of the psychiatric drugs taken over long periods of time had some very, um, very uh, unwanted effects. So of course, um, patients also didn't wanna keep taking the medications because they didn't feel like themselves or they didn't like how tired they felt. So when they weren't in the hospital, uh, one common behavior was that patients would be hosp hospitalized, be medicated, get some treatment, be discharged to the community. Um, arrangements were made for them to continue their medication, continue 
um, some oversight, sometimes psychotherapy. But of course, the patients could not be made to take their medication when they weren't in the in the hospital. And it, it it's actually not even true that patients can be made to take their medication when they're in the hospital. But their discharge from the hospital sometimes became conditional on them taking the medication. So so medication turned out not to be um, a um, magic cure for mental illness, which was the original hope that people could return to their community in large numbers and take medication and they would be functional. It was a, it was a wonderful hope, but um, not a realistic hope. And what has turned out to be true um, is that medication, a variety of medications are very, very helpful for for uh, a number of things that are called mental illnesses now. But medications don't change the quality of life automatically for people. They don't automatically give people relationships with other people. They don't automatically give people satisfying ways to live their day. It may keep them out of the hospital. It may keep them out of trouble with other people, but it doesn't give them a meaningful life. Something more, um, is necessary for people to, I think, have a meaningful life. So um, the community mental health centers are, are still the, the focus of treatment, but they, they do not have to provide the five original services. Um, you know, if you've read any newspapers that for the last 10 years, um, admissions to New Hampshire hospital are not, not only must be involuntary, involuntary, but they have to be, um, it, there's no space at the hospital for, for them. People can be suicidal involuntarily needing hospitalization and be in an emergency department of a general hospital for, for days um, waiting for a bed to become available in New Hampshire hospital. Um, the, the community, the, the inpatient treatments, um, have become a very complicated situation because hospitals depend upon insurance coverage, mostly for payment of all hospital patients. Um, patients with um, mental illnesses, well, the whole story of our health system is one of great complication. It's very complicated, complicated for patients, complicated for hospitals, um, lengths of stays, determinations of admissions. I mean. Medicaid and Medicare funding depends upon your diagnosis and your response to treatment and um, how, how many days you're paid. You can be paid to be hospitalized depends upon um, criteria that are sometimes realistic, but sometimes probably not realistic. And diagnoses of mental illnesses, frankly, are very hard to make. It's not clear always, this is the, this is the problem, here's the intervention. Um, that's true of not only psychoses, but depressions, um, bipolar disorders are, are um, there no, no, no mental illnesses are easy to treat. Even what are called adjustment disorders or acute disorders are not easy to treat. Um, so length of treatment is not um, scientifically like uh, this, this, this diagnosis, this treatment that for this long, and everybody's fine. It's not like that. It's more like, it's, it's, this is not a good analogy, but it's more like diabetes. Some people with diabetes, um, it's clear what the treatment needs to be. They can receive it. They, they can lead a, a life that's gonna be pretty normal. Other people, um, particularly type two diabetes, so many changes sometimes are, are necessary and a comprehensive plan is going to be very expensive. And if you don't have employment, you often don't have insurance. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very complicated situation. So anyway, um, deinstitutionalization led to the end of state hospital stays of, over long periods of time for most patients. Um, and if you look at the curve of discharges from hospitals and how how long people stay in hospitals, it's a really dramatic down drop curve. Um, the length of stay is pretty brief. 
um, with some exceptions, the um, people being put out into the community. One of the objectives of the Community Now Health Center Act was for people to be returned to their home communities. That's certainly true. Um, there were 500,000 people, half a million people at the height of um, state hospital populations in the 1950s into the 1960s. Most of those half a million people have been returned to communities. But if you look at the community, at the other side of some statistics, where did they go? A very large number are in, um, in the criminal justice system. They're, they're incarcerated for various reasons. So if you look at the curve of mentally ill um, persons who are incarcerated, it's sort of the mirror image of the, of the discharge from hospital to ad admission into um, criminal justice system. It happens because there's, there's no good alternative sometimes for people. So someone can be a nuisance, go to, go to uh, Shaw's supermarket because they have a delusive belief that aliens are going to um, take the form of fish that are being sold. I'm, I'm making this up, this isn't a real case. Uh, the fish that are being sold at Shaw's supermarket and that person can go into Shaw's supermarket, stop people saying, don't buy this, don't buy this food, don't buy this food, it's, it's um, gonna change you into an alien. Shaw's doesn't know what to do. Um, they're gonna call the police, the police are gonna come the person is going to be asked to leave or they'll be arrested for trespassing. They're not going to leave because the strength of their belief is that they have to, they have to save people from being turned into aliens. They get arrested for trespassing. They get involuntarily admitted because they have a severe mental illness to New Hampshire hospital. They might get put on medication. They might improve. At some point they're back in the community, but um, I guess the short, Part of what I'm trying to say is there aren't services in the community that are going to meet the needs of the, all the mentally ill people right now. And with the, the, the I, shining idealism of the Community Mental Health Centers Act has really been um, kind of corroded in different ways over time so that we have a patchwork. And, and where we are now, 2023, we have lots of people who are diagnosed with mental illnesses who are um, without homes. Um, they might be in the community, but they're not really receiving um, treatment in a, in a kind of organized overseeing way that's gonna be beneficial for them. We just haven't found um, the, the answer for what to do. So we don't have asylums where people can go and be um, taken out of the stress of life um, given the ideals that there were in the, in the 1840s, they, don't, they can't have that ideal environment. They can't have an ideal environment in their community because there aren't magically the right circumstances for all the hope of the Community Mental Health Centers Act to, to come true. Um, and we're at, a, we're at a terrible impasse right now in terms of these, what to do with the treatment of people, particularly um, indigent people, people who aren't working, who are on public support, um, to have a meaningful life. Um, their mental illnesses can be addressed in some ways. Um, and it's still true that the earlier they're addressed, the better the outcome is likely to be. And it's still true that if we identified a lot of um, people with mental illness very early on and intervened in an intense way, that would, that would be a good thing. But it's enormously expensive and almost impossible to do. So we're at a, a point where I think for the most part, we have some ideas, good ideas. There's never adequate funding and finding all the people that need to, to be uh, trained to intervene. It's, it's just a too great a challenge for us to meet. Now we can send people to the moon as they say, but actually we can send people to we can send a ship to an asteroid and get it to come back to Earth. But understanding the human life and what a human being needs um, to not be depressed, not be um, unable to function well, we don't have all the answers for that. I guess I'll just stop there.
And if there are more questions, I'm glad to answer them. Of course. Thank you so much, Dr. Shigori, for sharing your perspective and your experience with us and the history of New Hampshire Hospital. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat right now, but if anybody uh, still has more questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, Bernie, are you still are you still here? Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> Just wanted to double check. Um, would you like to share a little bit about the Citizens Advisory Group that NAMI New Hampshire sponsors um, and how that plays a role in New Hampshire Hospital? Sure, just very briefly. Um, and if you could put um, Martha's email in the um, chat, if anybody has any questions about um, the new, the uh, Citizens Advisory uh, Council, uh, certainly can shoot an email to uh, Martha who um, helps organize this for us. And, um, and Martha is, out, is off this week, so, but the, uh, Advisory Council is a combination of NAMI New Hampshire's efforts along with uh, New Hampshire Hospital. It's a group of volunteers that work together to um, just oversee um, some of the services that are uh, provided and, and provide support. Um, they, my understanding is they do a quarterly um, tour of the, of the uh, New Hampshire Hospital um, and are very involved in making sure that um, you know, that the environment is, is uh, positive and um, most of the, uh, the volunteers are family members or individuals who've um, experienced a mental health um, issue. And so it's very much uh, uh, run by folks who really have had the experience. And, um, and I don't know if you want to add anything, uh, Jace. Uh, sorry, I was dropping something in the chat, so I didn't hear okay. exactly what you said, but um, there is a training process to go through to yes. become an advisor. Um, so I believe I believe there's a training and an orientation and then um, probably a tour of the hospital as well to make sure that everyone is on the same page and knows what they're talking about. Um, and it seems like a really, really wonderful program. I have not taken it, but I have heard really good things about it. So if anyone is interested, I did put Martha's information in the webinar chat, um, which is different from the Q&A. So um, if you don't see it in the Q&A, that's why it's in the chat. Um, and so she is the one that coordinates this program and can give further information. And Martha Dory is uh, on staff here at NAMI New Hampshire. Um, she's part of our information and resource line. And I just want to encourage people also, um, if anybody has any questions, um, any, uh, you know, looking for resources or services, feel free to uh, uh, contact us here at uh, NAMI New Hampshire for our information and resource line. Um, and I think Jace is putting that in the chat, um, the number as well as the 988 um, and the New Hampshire rapid uh, response number. Uh, knowing that these are available for resources for uh, everybody, everybody here in New Hampshire. And, and I want to thank you, Do Dr. Shori, uh, for Shigori, for your your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, you know, I, I it, it increased my appetite to find out more <laughs> about the history. And um, I, th I think we've come a long way. Uh, and we still have a, a long way to go, but we have come a long way. And I just want to encourage people to continue to work together, um, to try to advocate for uh, resources and community-based services. Um, thank you. And I don't know if um, Susan is online. She, um, I think she's partially <laughs> online. Susan, is our, Susan Stearns is our uh, executive director here at NAMI New Hampshire. And I believe there's one more yes. question in the chat for you, Dr. Shigori. Okay. Let's see. Um, someone said insurance limitations on inpatient days are these, oh, that might, might have been delays. Um, insurance limitations on inpatient delays, are these being addressed via legislation? Example, Medicare 190 lifetime psychiatric days. Oh, maybe they didn't need days. I mean, I don't know the answer to that because the I think the 
there's such a a uh, complicated and delicate relation between um, laws, regulations, how they change, um, how they apply to particular individuals um, by diagnosis and by personal uh, circumstances that I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think they have to be addressed better than they are now. And that's why it's important to have um, NAMI and people involved from the community in, in trying to make clear what's going to be helpful in terms of stays. But I think stays, psychiatric stays that are paid for in the hospital really varies depending upon your insurance, depending upon um, a, a variety of things, actually. Thank and you. I would add that if folks are interested in advocacy, they can sign up for our public policy alerts. They can also join our public policy committee. Um, you know, more information about that can be found on our website. The other thing in terms of things like uh, changes to at the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services level at the federal level, NAMI National does a lot of that work and we'd be happy to bring that information forward and see where they at, are at with something like that. I can, I can tell you they do have a Hill Day planned for NAMI executive directors on November 29th. I will be attending and we'll be meeting with all the, at least the offices of all four of our members of the federal delegation. So please always feel free to, re free to reach out. Um, we can't always impact federal legislation directly, but we can certainly share that message with NAMI National. That's great. Um, and Susan, where can people go in order to sign up for those public policy alerts, just in case they aren't sure? So on our website, and um, I was, say, I was just trying, trying to, to remember exactly which page it's on. If you go to our website, namianh.org, it is under Get Involved, Take Action, I believe. Take Action, okay. And if you can't find it, you can always email us at advocacy at namianh.org and the advocacy team will get that and help, be able to help you. I believe I found the correct page, so I'm dropping that in the chat right now as well. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so I believe that was the last question in the chat from our guests today. And we put a lot of really, really great resources in the webinar chat. So feel free to go and look at those and copy those down. Otherwise, you can always reach out to me at jtroy, T-R-O-I-E, at NAMINewHampshire.org, and I can always send those along as well. We will be forwarding this recording in a follow-up email, so please look out for that as well. Thank you all. I, I appreciate the Thank opportunity to, to talk with you. Thank you, Dr. Shigori. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was wonderful hearing everything you had to say, Dr. Shigori. Well, thanks. I'm going to leave now. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone.